each week. We're grateful for those who serve us in music and are grateful to your workforce and for us today, ladies. What a great thought, right? Lord, may we long to worship. May we long to worship the Lord. And yet worshiping is an act of faith. It's an act of faith. There's a very famous line in a movie that our, our home watches a lot because it's one of Jared's favorites. And in uh, the story of Aladdin, he asks the princess in the village, before he knows she's a princess, he says, do you trust me? <laughs> Later on in the movie, while he's standing on a magic carpet and she thinks he's Prince, Prince Ababwa, uh, he says, do you trust me? And she makes a connection of who, that he's really the, the, the kid from the, from, the, from the town. Interesting question, isn't it? Do you trust me? Today's message, the fruit of the Spirit, is faith. We've looked at love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Today we're going to look at faith. The fruit of the Spirit is faith. I might ask you this morning, do you have faith in me? Well, what does this mean? If you say yes, I might ask, what level of faith are you talking about? Do you trust me financially, morally, eternally, religiously? Or maybe you trust some skill that I might have. How, how much faith you would have in me would probably depend on how well you knew me. Some stranger on a street says, do you trust me? You're probably going to say, no, I don't know you. How can I trust you? This Wednesday, several of us are going to put our trust in an airplane, an airline, a pilot, a mechanic, an engineer, an air traffic controller, and we're going to get on an airplane and be expected to be taken from Jakarta to land in Medan. When we get off the airplane, we're going to expect to be in Medan. That's a lot of faith, isn't it? It's a lot of faith in a lot of people. So we practice faith all the time. I asked Bobby an unfair question last night, kind of a tongue-in-cheek question. <laughs> She's laughing already. I said, do you have more faith in me than in Google? <laughs> she said yes, then she paused. Except, <laughs> that's not a fair question. We might say, I believe with all my heart I can count on you. Or, humanly speaking, as much trust as I can give, I give to you. This is probably the trust of a family. With all my heart, with all that I have, I trust you. But there are still limits to this, aren't there? There are limits to human trust because there's limits to human ability. But when it comes to faith in God, we realize as the object of our faith is infinitely greater. It's infinitely greater. This is the object of our faith. You're driving your car or your motorcycle and you come to a bridge. Do you get off your motorcycle or do you get out of your car to walk across the bridge to make sure it's good? Not usually. You just drive across the bridge. The last person made it. You expect it to hold you. A few years ago, there was a bridge in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I think it was St. Paul, actually. During rush hour, the bridge collapsed, and several cars went down into the water below, and people died, and suddenly we became leery of bridges. When it comes to faith in God, He, the object of our faith, is infinitely greater. We don't put faith in people who fail us. Thankfully, the Lord Jesus never fails. He never fails. Do you agree with me today? The Lord never fails. Can you agree with that? What about, though, the time when you prayed for Him to, do, to, to fix something that was, that was broken and you wanted him to restore it back to normal. Your job 
fell apart or your, your, your health fell apart or someone you loved, their health fell apart and, 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 and life suddenly changed. I was standing outside a, a hospital in Chicago and I, I had an opportunity to go and work for a Christian publisher and they'd bought me a ticket and they'd set up a meeting for me to come and to meet with them and our son ended up in the hospital that day. I called the, the, the director of this, this publishing house and I said, I can't make this trip. I don't know what that means. I don't know if you'll reschedule. I don't know, but I can't make that trip. We say, Lord, how are you going to fix this? And, and sometimes he doesn't fix it the way we want him to fix it. Sometimes he lets our life be very different after the problem. Is he still good? Do we still trust him? Is our faith still confident? I have another question for you today. What is the opposite of faith? What do you think? What's the opposite of faith? Non-faith? What's the opposite of faith? Worry? Yeah. What else? What are some opposites of faith? Fear? Fear of the unknown? Fear of what might happen? Any other thoughts? Opposites of faith? Hopelessness. Yeah. Things fall apart. We can't figure out how to do it. We feel hopeless about it. Does God want us to live in worry and in fear and in hopelessness? Well, we know the answer to that, don't we? He wants us to live in the confidence of faith in Him. Faith in His salvation. Faith in His goodness. Faith in His provision. Faith in His healing power. Faith in His eternal plan for our life. He wants us to live above worry, above fear, and above hopelessness. Where does faith come from? Well, Ephesians 2, 8 is pretty clear, isn't it? By grace are we saved through faith, and that faith is not of yourself. The faith itself is a gift of God. So do we just, do we just drum up faith? Do we just become people of faith out of sheer willpower? That doesn't work very long. This morning, Axel read to us from Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who come to him must believe that he exists and that he, then, is the, re is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The reward of faith, then, is God's reward. We have faith in who all that God is. He responds with the reward of faith. Last week, we had some, some of you came to lunch last week, and one of you said, I've asked God to give me a vision of himself. I would just like to see him. I agree, but he never has. <laughs> I haven't had a vision of Jesus. I've never seen God. I've never had that, what some people may have experienced, a visual of God. But you know, Jesus told the woman at the well that God is a spirit, and those who worship him, worship him in what? In spirit and in truth. God doesn't say, I will give you a visual. In fact, he, gives the, he says the opposite. I'm a spirit. You're not going to see me. And by the way, if you see a spirit, it's not a spirit. We don't see spirits. We don't see God, but we worship him from our spirit. Our spirit acknowledges that he is God, and we worship him. Therefore, we are saved by faith, and we obey the word of God by faith. Right? We don't obey the word of God because it makes sense all the time. You read Ephesians 4 and 5, and you find several commands. Wives are commanded to submit to their husbands. Ladies, I don't think there's a harder command in Scripture for you than that. You don't obey that because you're good at it. You obey it by faith. Husbands are commanded to love their wives like Christ loved the church. 
that's another one of the most difficult commands of Scripture. You don't love your wife because you just love her and she's so lovable because someday she might not be. You love her because God commanded you to, and you do it by faith. We obey the word by faith. Then he says, children, obey your parents. All you kids here say that's the hardest, hardest command in the Bible. And I, I don't disagree with you. And you don't agree with it because you don't agree with Scripture because you think your parents are always doing the right thing. You agree with Scripture by faith. This continues throughout the Word of God. Anytime we're given a command in Scripture, we might not understand it, so we do it by faith. Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 tells us that we live by faith in this life, not by sight. But one day we will be with the Lord and then we'll see Him. So one day our faith will turn to sight. Until then, we are called to follow the Lord only by faith. I want to take a couple of minutes to look at the fruit of the spirits today. The other fruits of the Spirit are practiced by faith. So I'm going to put them up, and then I'm going to reference these. And I want to reference how these are followed and kept by faith. Now, we've already discussed each of these. Well, it's up for the last two. We'll get to, we'll get to them. But we looked at these, these together. And let me, let me look at some points with you about this. When we love someone, we love them because God calls us to love them. We do not know what God's purposes are, for we do not know the future. Therefore, we love them by faith. Not all people are easy to love. Some easier than others. Some are just downright hard to love. But if the Spirit of God is in us, we love them by faith. Joy comes when we have faith in the trials. That's what James said. Count it all joy when you have a trial. How do you do that? How do you have joy in a trial? By faith. By believing that God has designed the trial for our good. So in the midst of the trial, we can have joy by faith. Peace, the gift of peace, comes when we have faith in God's eternal salvation. The Bible says that the peace of God passes all human understanding. We are at peace, and we may not even know why. This is the peace that comes from God when we have faith in Him. Our faith in Him enables us to enjoy His peace. Showing long-suffering towards someone is very difficult. And we talked about how this quality of long-suffering is, is, is bearing with someone's difficulty because they need to be saved. And in their, in their, their sinfulness, they're, they're very hard to get along with, very difficult to enjoy. And so, so the Spirit gives us an attitude of long-suffering toward that person. How do we practice long-suffering? We do so by faith in the reality that God wants to save them. We have faith in God's plan of salvation, therefore we are long-suffering. We, we study gentleness, being a willingness to show kindness even when we don't want to. How do you show kindness? How do you practice gentleness when you don't want to? You do it by faith because this is what God calls us to. But I, I want to tell them what I really think. And the Spirit says, no, throttle that back a little bit. Don't say those things. Believe that I'm in control. Trust me and, and be gentle instead. And so by faith we practice gentleness. Last week we studied goodness. The abundance of God poured out to save us, to keep us, and to protect us until we reach His eternal home with Him. God calls us, then, to show goodness to one another. How do we do that? We're not naturally giving selfless creatures. We are naturally selfish and taking. How do I show goodness to somebody else? By faith. God showed me his goodness. He calls me to show goodness to others and to do it by faith. In two weeks, we'll study meekness. Meekness is the willingness to let God defend you at every turn. 
popular expression would be like this. Meekness is that believing God has your back. (laughs) You don't need to defend yourself, and you can trust God to defend you. That takes faith, doesn't it? Because we want to defend ourselves. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty good at defending myself. Have you ever responded to a nasty text or a nasty email, hit send, and wish you hadn't hit send? That's the opposite of meekness. To wait and to let God defend us is an act of faith. The idea of temperance or self-control is only practiced by faith because just like a child, our flesh wants what it wants, when it wants, for how long it wants it. We don't want to be told we can't have it. We don't want to be told we shouldn't do it. We don't want someone telling us it's not good for us. But self-control is practiced by faith that God knows what he is doing. And he who created me is someone I can trust with the desires of my life. You see how faith is now intertwined, woven into the fruit of the Spirit? I find it quite interesting. Just a side note, the word faith in the NIV appears 458 times. (laughs) Maybe it's a message God knew we needed to hear a lot. We're not naturally going to be people of great faith. And so we're reminded of it a great deal. I have two points for us. First point is faith is not. Second point is faith is. All right? First point today, faith is not. Faith is not trust in which you cannot see and cannot prove. That's not what faith is. Isaiah 118, God calls us to a reasoned faith. Come, Reason with me, he says. He wants us to know him. God has revealed himself to us through his word. And and there is a a difference between the God of the Bible and the Allah of Islam. Here's a key difference is the God of the Bible has revealed himself to his people through his word. He wants us to know who he is. He wants us to be able to trust him because we understand who he is through revelation. Faith is, God calls us to a reasoned faith. Therefore, faith is not fatalism. Faith is not fatalism. Just, you have to accept something you can't change. You have to accept something you can't really believe or buy into. That's fatalism. That is not faith. So faith is not Trust in which you cannot see and cannot prove. Second, faith is not blindly accepting something because you are told you must accept. This is religion. You can put any religion in the blank here. We are blank because our parents are. You can even put Baptist in that. Any religion that you want, any system of, uh, of world religion you want to put in there, you put it in the blank. We are blank because our parents are. This is what our family has always done. This is what we are going to do. Is that faith? I don't think so. That's, that's, you're being forced to blindly accept something because your family has. Your grandparents did. Your great-grandparents did. Therefore, you have no choice. You must just blindly accept what they accepted. That is not faith. God reveals himself. He reveals his truth. And he calls it to us to accept it. It is, a, it is the revealed word of God we hold in our hands. From this revealed, in these revealed truths, he calls us to put our faith in, to accept it and to believe it. And I want you to see faith is not something we are naturally good at. Someone may say of you, she's always been a person of great faith. Someone might say, well, faith comes easy for you. But me, I just don't trust anyone. None of us are born people of great faith. We're all born skeptics. We're all born doubters. We're all born wanting our own way. We're not naturally good at faith. Nobody is. If you know a person of great faith, it's because they have believed the word of God. 
They've accepted God's word as true. And they consistently cast out the doubts to believe the word of God. They've practiced what we might call a due diligence of the scripture. Perhaps your job requires you to to do a due diligence of something and to make a presentation. Suppose you were required to to, to open the the scriptures and and to due diligence of the scriptures so that when you were were finished with your due diligence, you would have a, a statement of fact, a statement that you could believe in. This is what we're called to. We're called to this. In fact, when we don't search the Scriptures for answers, we are probably in the same place where Eve was when Satan tempted her. Like I said last Sunday, Satan said to Eve, God isn't really care, doesn't really care for you. If God was really good, he'd let you take of this tree also. Had she been secure in the word of God, had she been secure in who God was and how God had met her needs, she would not have been open to that temptation. So the the, the more we understand of God and who he is and of his word, the less the temptations of this world are going to be able to pull us away. Satan says, Things like this. Do you see that poison? It's good for you. Go ahead and try it. Do you feel that anger? It's good for you. Hold on to it. Satan says, do you sense that lust? Go ahead and embrace it. It's not going to hurt you. But if we are people of the revealed word of God, when Satan throws these temptations, we have something else to believe. Are you with me? You understand this today? What is faith? I've already made this statement. We'll make it again. Faith is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Our faith needs an object. We don't just become people of faith. The man we ministered to his family. He came to church for two years as an unbeliever. By his own admission, he wasn't a believer in Christ. He read the Bible, beginning to end. Know what he said? Doesn't mean anything to me. He didn't possess the Holy Spirit. It was like reading a book, a novel, a newspaper to him. It had no purpose. It had no interest. He didn't have any faith. In the author. When you know the author of the word of God. And you read it. It becomes very personal doesn't it? You read it. And and the messages kind of leap off the pages. Into your own heart and life. I told you about my my dad. Who at 85 years old. Called me in and said Steve. I've read something from the Bible. I've never read before. (laughs) I said dad. You've read the Bible through. Every year for years of your life, your Bibles are marked. You've preached it. What do you mean? You read something you haven't seen before. <laughs> well, what he was saying was that the, the nature of the Bible is it's, it's alive. And as you read it in different times of your life, you, you learn different things that apply to you at that time of your life. It is the living word. It, it is the gift of God. Eve didn't believe it, and she took the forbidden fruit. Israel didn't believe it when Moses brought it down and they worshipped idols. So we're faced with this gift of God, faith, and then we're given the word of God to read it with that gift of faith. And we realize that God teaches us then from his word by faith in what he has written. Knowledge isn't enough. Because faith takes knowledge and makes it our own. Now it becomes knowledge that I need. Knowledge that helps me. Knowledge that carries me. Faith's a gift from God. And then secondly, faith is required for our salvation. 
that's required. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Then he said this, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. There are those who take the first part of that verse and teach baptismal salvation. That's not what he was saying here because the second part clarifies it. If you don't believe, you cannot be saved. It's required. You have to have faith in the work of Jesus Christ to be saved. So when someone says to me, I've been a Christian my whole life, I shake my head and say, no, you haven't. Maybe you've been a Christian on paper, but you've not been saved your whole life. You're not saved until you believe on your own in the work of Christ for your sin. came across a YouTube video yesterday, and by the, I hadn't heard of the organization, so I looked them up to see if I should watch the video. They had a home page, and they had a doctrinal statement, so I read through their doctrinal statement. I got to baptism. The doctrinal statement said, uh, baptism by immersion should happen when you're 20 years old for the washing away of your sins. I said, well, I'm not going to watch your, your video. You guys are off. Baptism doesn't wash away sins. Only Jesus does. But can you imagine? There's a, some group out here that teaches all their people, all you got to do is come to the baptistry at 20 years old or afterwards, and, and your sins will be washed away by the water. Well, if that was possible, my friends, then Jesus died in vain, right? If we can be saved by baptism, then Jesus didn't need to die. By the will of God, Jesus needed to die because we needed a Savior. And our faith must be placed in Him. A lot of people don't come to faith in Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 tells us why. Paul writes writes these words, But even if our gospel is veiled, and he's speaking of the veil that was over Moses' face, something hidden, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. Why don't they believe? Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. People don't believe because Satan blinds their eyes. What happens when the Spirit of God opens blinded eyes? People believe. They come to faith because their eyes are open. The eyes of their understanding are open. And that which Satan has closed, being made open, now they're able to believe and be saved. So why does Satan keep people's eyes closed? So they won't be saved. Why does he keep people in sin? So they won't be saved. Why does he keep people away from any any gospel message or gospel church? So they won't be saved. People put up all kinds of excuses, but the truth is Satan has blinded their eyes so they will not be saved. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Can you be saved apart from faith? Not if not having faith makes it impossible to please God. So the, the, the turnaround of Hebrews eleven six 6 is this. When we have faith, God is pleased. You want to please God in your life? Put your faith in Him. Stop trusting yourself. Stop trusting religion. Stop trusting anything else. Stop living in fear and worry. Put your faith in the God of heaven who has revealed Himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is pleased when we put our faith in him. Romans 10, 9 speaks to confessing Christ and believing in him. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God is raised from the dead, then you will be saved. It's acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord and then putting your faith, believing in him. Okay? Let's have a little language lesson together. 
All right? Let's go back to school for a couple of minutes, have a little lang lesson in language. You ready? All right. Romans 10, 9 to 17 uses two words consistently. These two words have the same root word. Believe equals faith to believe or to put your faith in something. Believe is the verb form of this Greek word pistis. Faith is the noun form. Faith comes by hearing. The root is this Greek word pistis in both words. So when you have faith, you believe. Same word. Bobby and I are trying, trying to learn your language. Pray for us, would you please? It's like, it's like cramming round pegs into square holes. It's having, having, having trouble fitting. But we're learning that, that your language has many roots. And the, a verb or a noun can be determined by a prefix or a suffix. Or by context within a sentence. Same thing here. This Greek word, P-I-S-T-I-S, pistis, is the root. By itself, it means faith. You add a prefix to it, and it means believe. It becomes a verb. So as you go through Romans 10, 9 to 17, you find, you find throughout this passage, this teaching, that you need to have faith so that you will believe. You need to know what you're believing, the noun, so you will have the action of believing, the verb. It's not, it, it's not enough just to know. Doesn't the Bible say that Satan himself believes and trembles? Satan believes in God. The difference of his belief is it just makes him afraid of God. He's not going to turn from his nature and cry out to God for mercy. The difference is we believe, and then we put action to that belief by believing in the work of Christ to save us from our sin. All right? What we've seen today also is that faith will produce works for the Lord in our lives, which is the other fruits of the Spirit. Someone says to me, and this happened, someone said to me once, how come nobody believes I'm a Christian? <laughs> I said, well, let's look at your life from Galatians 5.22. All right? Which of these fruits of the Spirit are evidenced in your life? As we walked through the fruits of the Spirit, the only ones that she could evidence were the ones that were internal. There wasn't one external evidence of the Spirit that came out of this lady's life. And so people on the outside looking in said to her, you probably aren't even a Christian because there's no evidence of the Spirit in your life. How do we know that we are saved? Well, one way we know is the fruit of the Spirit comes out, this love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. These things come out as the fruit of the Spirit is in us. So remember, we are all born without faith. We are all born with eyes blinded by sin. And without faith, we did not believe we didn't believe that God, who God was. We didn't believe in the work of Christ on our behalf. We did not give our lives to follow him. We did not believe. However, when God shined his truth into our hearts, he opened our eyes that were blinded by Satan and sin. Then we were able to put our faith into the knowledge of him and then act upon that knowledge by believing in him. Now we walk by faith, day by day, with eyes of faith that God is in control. How does this happen? How do we come to faith? I want to use one big word today. It's not unusual. Marvel com comics have made this word pretty natural. And the word is supernatural. We come to faith by the supernatural work of God in our lives. Maybe we're journeying. Maybe we're struggling with life. Maybe we're feeling some hopelessness, like Ben said. We're on a journey. Someone begins to give us the truth. 
And perhaps one day somebody gives us John 14, 6, like was given to Daisy. And on that journey, somewhere, some scripture opens opens our eyes, the Spirit of God enlightens our understanding, and supernaturally God enables us the faith to believe, and suddenly it all makes sense. This is a supernatural work of God in our life, and we're thankful for that. He opens our blinded eyes to His truth, and we believe unto eternal salvation. But then he calls us to live by faith. When Israel was in the wilderness, their stomachs were hungry. And they asked a question to Moses. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Two million people, women and children, everybody's hungry. And Moses said, God is going to meet your need. And the people said, in essence, yeah, right. How in the world could that happen? I wish I had a mind to remember these things, but somebody took the amount of food it would take to feed 2 million people in the desert, and and they they transferred that, that, that amount of food into trucks and to trains. And how many trucks and train cards it would take to bring that much food every day to 2 million people. The question was, is God able to repair a table in the wilderness, what was the answer? Yes, he was able. Yes, he was able. Is God able to walk you through the valley of the shadow of death? Do you have faith he is? We don't like that that valley. We particularly don't like it if we walk into the valley with someone and we walk out alone. We don't like that valley. Can you walk in it by faith? Is God still good? Is God able to meet the relational needs he puts in us? Some of you long to be married. Is God able to meet the relational need that he put in you? I say yes, he is. Seek him. Don't follow the way of this world and try to find relationship apart from God's way that always leads, leaves people empty. Trust the Lord. Live by faith in His promises to meet your needs. Is God enable, is able to help you raise your children by faith in Him? They, that they might come to faith? I believe so. We walk by faith in every part of our life, don't we? Aren't you glad you're saved by faith? Now you're called to live by faith. The fruit of the Spirit in your life, if you have believed, is faith. Are you a woman of faith today? Are you a man of faith today? Has God opened your eyes to his salvation, supernaturally opened them? Have you believed that Jesus died to save you from your sin, and are you living obedient to your faith, submitting to the word of God, to live by faith, even when you can't understand it, living by faith. Let's pray together. Lord, help us today to to really consider what what, what you want us to know, how you want us to live. Lord, this is a key difference of the Christian walk and other religions, for you want us to live by faith, as it were, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of our lives. You don't want us to take a vacation from the walk of faith. You don't want us to turn away from your instruction and your guidance and your leading. Father, help us to be a people of greater faith today. We come to you and say, as the disciples of old, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our confidence in you. Reveal yourself to us that our faith may become stronger in the object of our faith in you. Thank you. We can come to you today. Lord, if we need today to ask you to forgive us for not trusting you, then we ask you today to do so. Please forgive us for our lack of faith. Please forgive us for not pleasing you by not living by faith. May we live differently today and tomorrow and the rest of our lives. 
Lord, if someone's here without you today, I pray they'd cry out to you to save them from their sin by faith in the work of Jesus. May we see men and women saved by faith, we pray in your name. Amen.